Hello, my name is Dr. Jeff Green, and today we're going to be talking about philosophy, religion, and higher education. My goal is to introduce you to some themes in philosophy and religion, and encourage you to begin thinking about how those intersect with the world of higher education. We are going to begin today by considering an essay by Richard John Newhouse, a great religious thinker um, in American 20th century life and a little bit into the 21st century. Among other things, he founded First Things, the magazine was its editor. And this um, article, The Christian University 11 Theses, you can find on First Things website. And I've included the link here on the introduction slide. And you also find full bibliographic information in the very back of the slideshow. But I want to start with this essay because I think it really brings about um, the right attitude for us to begin exploring how philosophy and religion intersect with higher education. I say it like that because it opens our minds up to the idea that philosophy and religion and talking about them inside higher education is something all of us have to do. I think sometimes there's a tendency to think that, well, Christian universities might have some sort of particular philosophy or religion that they care about. But the basic university is one of free thinking, where there's no interference by philosophy or religion, is that it's really each professor has full um, ability just to believe what they want to believe, and it's a free thinking paradise. And that sort of serves as the basis of the idea of a university. And then the Christian university is kind of the strange thing that's like a university, but also has Christianity mixed into it. I'm thankful that um, Richard John Newhouse addresses that at the very beginning of his essay here, when he writes, there's no such thing as a university pure and simple. It is therefore misleading to say that a Christian university has a dual identity, one by virtue of being a university and another in virt by virtue of being Christian. He'll go on in this essay to talk about it, and again, I encourage you to read it. But his point here is that universities are not neutral. To even say that a university is neutral, what a lot of people mean by that is that it's secular. But notice that's not a neutral stance. That's a stance that says that religion doesn't have a place in the discussions about the pursuit of truth and the development of flourishing human beings. When we think about universities, we like to imagine that they're nonpartisan, that they're not part of society, that they're sort of separate from it. But I think upon reflection, you can see that every university actually has beliefs that it really cares about and that it advocates. Those beliefs might be a sort of corporatism, right? Maybe the university is dedicated to helping businesses thrive and providing an educated workforce. And so the values it teaches are going to be those that are best for a workforce to help the whatever the regional industry is survive. Um, many universities, and we'll talk about this later in the slideshow, might be committed to sort of a progressive ethical stance where their main goal is to right wrongs from the past and encourage various um, reconciliation efforts among different groups that have been oppressed in the past and try to um, balance out the scale, so to speak. Um, you see that a lot in contemporary society. And so you'll see universities that really value an agenda that's primarily about, say, feminism or various types of um, scholarship that promotes LGBTQ ideas or scholarship um, that produce, um, produces, and you'll hear this word a lot nowadays, but sort of um, intersectionalism or this uh, um, critical race theory, you might hear that word too. And so there's some universities that see that as their primary agenda. Um, other universities might be dedicated to environmentalism. Um, some universities are dedicated to power and prestige. But whatever the case, universities are not um, found in just pure neutral space. They have a goal. And so a Christian university then, um, that Christianity is not something added in. It is supposed to signify the fact that some universities have as their goal serving the kingdom and serving the church. And I want to talk about modernism. So I'm going to use modernism to refer roughly 
to ideas that began around the time of Descartes. Um, so right after um, late medieval times and all the way up until probably the mid 20th century. Now it's a little fuzzy on either end of that, but that's because movements are fuzzy, right? Ideas don't change necessarily all at once, right? Sometimes there's gradual change, sometimes there's overlap between movements. Obviously, that's a very large amount of time as well. And so there's gonna be some diversity within those understanding of what modernism is. You're gonna see different types of modernism um, flourish in different areas and different times all throughout this big time period. I mean, we're looking at, you know, basically Descartes, which is early 17th century, all the way into the middle of the 20, 20th century. And so, you know, that's what, a good 300 years there, <laughs> at least. And so you're going to get a lot of different ideas in the context of those 300 years. But you'll notice some trends during this time. And one of them is a move away from religious commitments and religious institutions. You see this outside the university, for example, in hospitals, many hospitals that come, begin and sort of start as religious organizations eventually secularize so that by the time we get to the 20th century, they might be religious in name only, right? And that their functional operating procedures and how they see medicine is through a purely secular lens. Um, you're going to see this in everyday society as well. You see beginning of... Um, more um, people that are willing to say they don't believe in a God or they don't believe in religion or that maybe they're, they don't believe in a particular version of Christianity, even if they believe in some sort of God. Um, these trends take time, of course, too, right? Um, some of those more dramatic um, effects of modernism aren't till the very end of this time period. A lot of what happens here is an effort for Christianity and science to figure out how to relate to one another inside the context of scholarship and research. All right, so George Margin points to this when he observes, the claims to ground the distinctive aspects of Biblicist Christianity on science in a universal common sense epistemology put traditional Protestantism in a most vulnerable position. Once natural science took the steps of operating without the implicit assumption of a creator, its findings would be as uncongenial to traditional Christianity as were its new premises. So what are we talking about here? Let's unpack this. Well, let's start with the word just epistemology. You know, when we talk about epistemology, that's the study of knowledge, right? So when we are epistemologists, when we ask them, hey, what do you study? They might say things like, I want to know how our beliefs become knowledge. What makes a true belief um, knowledge as opposed to just an opinion or just something we happen to believe without justification or warrant. Uh, epistemologists might wonder if we should be skeptical of things, and if so, how much, right? Um, is there any answer to various skeptical claims? How do we gain understanding, right? These are the sort of questions that epistemologists would ask. Epistemology then is just the study of knowledge, and it could be a theory of knowledge. We could talk about a particular epistemology, a particular set of answers to those sort of questions. In this case, Marsden is talking about a universal common sense epistemology, a belief that all people, right, that's the universal part, through the use of common sense, through the use of their everyday reason, can come to a shared consensus about answers to the big questions in life, and that those would be compatible with scripture, and in particular interpretation of scripture that Protestants had. And so there wasn't a fear in the beginning of modernism that rationality and the Bible would conflict. But once Christianity got away from understanding their own religion and the truth of Christianity as being revealed knowledge um, through scripture and thought that, well, anyone will be able to agree to this if they just, you know, work out science. Then when science started to give answers that um, were at tension with the understanding of scripture, for example, debates about the age of the earth, debates about the origins of people um, in our current time, right, debates between some scholars with regards to ethical issues um, regarding gender and sexuality and what um, scripture says about that. When Christians conceded that in an institutional level at universities and thought that universal common sense epistemology 
would be able to be um, the basis of a shared of a common of a consensus of a shared rationale that everyone can have. The Christian part of that began to break off, and you'll see that in so many different ways in Marsden. But also, if you just look back at the history of universities, right, as they move from a more explicit and a more and a version of Christianity that's more revealed, right, um, goes back to um, what's revealed in the Word of God. You'll start to see that they become more secular. And that um, the secular professors, the secular institutions, then reject parts of their Christian heritage as well. Second, when we think about modernism, we see in general a confidence in the power of reason to improve things for all mankind. Now, there's skeptics to this sort of rationalism and this modernism. For example, you see in the Romantic movement, for ex um, take Frankenstein, right? Um, in Frankenstein, we find a monster that gets created by science and um, wreaks havoc. Um, but outside those examples, in which there are some, in general, there's this hope that modernism will deliver a better world for us all. And there's reasons, you know, to be hopeful here, right? When we look at the advances in medicine that occurred towards the late end of modernism, when we look at how science was able to provide food and industry for many people, it looks like, yeah, wow, science is definitely the way to go. It's going to be able to deliver us, our power of our reasoning is going to be able to deliver a better life for us. It's only when we get to postmodernism that we start to get that um, deeper suspicion of science that we have today by many people. And then finally, um, you have the success broadly of empiricism. Now, I don't necessarily mean here empiricism as in British empiricism versus continental rationalism, for those of you who are familiar with early modern um, debates inside philosophy. I mean, broadly, the idea that the way to gain knowledge about the world, the way to pursue truth, is through various empirical means. Right? It's actually a rejection of a certain type of philosophy, right? a philosophy that looks into metaphysics, philosophy that's um, much more focused on reason and a priori thought. Um, empiricism largely wins the day in modernism. You can see sort of the high point of modernism in something called either logical empiricism or what would really be a subset of it, logical positivism, um, as you see how the logical positivists argued that things like religion and metaphysics so was kind of like just bad poetry um, and that it really didn't um, amount to anything, that maybe even the pronouncements about religion were meaningless. And I included a link there for you to look up if you want to learn more about logical empiricism and logical positivism. You might enjoy that article, just a way to a little bit to learn about that particular intellectual trend. But the, the sum total of these effects on the university was to push university leaders and university curriculum towards much more a science-based curriculum, to a curriculum that prized research, maybe over other endeavors, that saw religion, philosophy, and broadly even the humanities to some degree as needing to be sidelined, but in particular sidelining any sort of religious commitment for an institution um, as well. And remember what we talked about in the last slide, that's not a neutral decision, right? This is a decision about how we discover knowledge and then what the effect should be on the university. I want to conclude today by talking about postmodernism. So the world saw a lot of changes in the 20th century. One of those changes was a suspicion of the ability for science to deliver a better world. This happens in fits and starts of the 20th century, but you can probably think of yourself ways in which science hasn't delivered necessarily a better world. Um, for many, the sh sheer amount of destruction that World War I and World War II produced because of the Industrial Revolution, because of the ability of science to help us in better ways and um, better is maybe the wrong word there, right? But more destructive ways, more powerful ways to um, kill and destroy made many people suspicious that this whole science thing is really a good idea. Of course, the best example of this is in the concept and then the production of nuclear weapons, right? Um, we have seen the devastation of just the very beginning of nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
The idea that now we can um, blow up the entire world with nuclear weapons makes many people wonder if we've gone too far and if our scientific knowledge has gone too far. In addition, the destruction of various ecosystems and species in the planet because of industrialization and again um, supposed progress um, makes many people wonder um, if the goals of the modernist were really what we ought to adopt, right? whether that way of accumulating wealth and power is what we should pursue. In addition, there was movement inside science that seemed to many to be very irrational, right? That made us be very suspicious of what our eyes were telling us. You look to quantum mechanics and you look to special and general relativity. We find out that the world isn't just a bunch of um, Lego blocks playing according to Newtonian physics, but instead, you know, things like black holes and wormholes and um, light bending and time travel and all this stuff and randomness at the very heart of our physical equations made many people wonder, like, is really, again, modernism, um, is science able to deliver truth? <clears throat> you have movements inside psychology, right, that emphasize the unconscious um, and Freud and Jung and others. And in doing that, we start to begin to distrust our own mind. You start to see institutions break down, not just with inside religious institutions, but you know, political institutions as well, right? In America, at least, things like the Vietnam War and Watergate erode the trust people have in authorities. We see this even in journalism today, right? How few of us, right, actually trust any news organization to be delivering truth. Instead, we expect it to be partisan and to be biased and not necessarily to be telling us the whole entire story. What's interesting about that is the academy tries in many ways to hold its ground and tries to be a bastion of truth. Uh, my colleagues that I know, um, both at HBU and other places, really believe the universities can pursue truth. But what you see inside universities then is a greater separation between universities and the outside world. You see that often universities are seen as out of touch, right? That people distrust universities themselves. Within universities, there's suspicion of our ability to come to any sense of shared truth, right? Instead, many people think there is no narrative, right? There is no agreement that we can find, say, about the great texts we ought to teach. Right? There's no way in which different disciplines can communicate across their disciplines and their heritage is to come to a, um, a shared sense of truth. And so all there becomes then is power and different traditions fighting over rhetorical power, and rhetorical positioning between them in an effort to show that their discipline is somehow more effective or more rhetorically powerful than another or more morally superior than another discipline. What this means, I think, is if you look at universities and also if you look at our world, that um, there becomes a lack of purpose, a sort of hollowing out of institutions. And inside that hollowing out, there's a vacuum to where some institutions pursue wealth and power that is in many ways unchecked. Even it's ostensibly or on the surface being checked by sort of modesty and um, shared human liberalism or values, in truth, many universities, I think, struggle to articulate what they're pursuing because they've rejected a transcendent worldview when it comes to um, Christianity. And they also now no longer believe that there is one truth that they're all pursuing and that they can successfully find. Um, one quote I found that I thought was really interesting on this, um, and you can look back into the references to see the web link here, this article about existentialism. Um, as Burnham and Papadrenoulis claim, the achievements of the natural sciences also empty value, the empty nature of value and meaning. Unlike a created cosmos, for example, we cannot expect a scientifically described cosmos to answer our questions concerning value or meaning. So here they're expressing this existentialist idea that the world is in many ways meaningless and that we can't read its meaning off its sleeve without a creator without, again, that transcendent God who, in creation, just like when we create something, we create it for a purpose, God creates us for a purpose. Without that, we're sort of alone and lost, and we suffer this existential crisis of meaning, 
right? It turns out that it's up to us to determine what the meaning is. And that causes anguish and all sorts of different emotions. And maybe it can become overcome, but only with heroic effort by us as protagonists. And of course, existentialism, like all isms, as we've talked about, varies a lot. But I think this is a really good quote here, illustrating this postmodern trend of not, not seeing in science the ability to deliver us meaning. Finally, without the lack of um, shared meaning and truth and lack of any one narrative, <clears throat> what you'll find is that oftentimes there's now a focus on the identity of the individual and their own understanding of themselves. And this is, I think, especially true broadly in Western civilization now. Um, we've rejected the idea that we are made in the image of God. And in doing that, we've now had to find something else to write our identity in, right? To um, say that this is who we are. For many, that might be their job or their bank account or wealth. But for others, it might be things like their own people group, right? Um, whether that's a class, right? Being lower class, middle class, or upper class, right? Wherever you um, find meaning in socioeconomic structure, it might be in race, right? It might be an orientation, sexual orientation, or just in sexual expression itself. Whatever it is, we've now put the focus on the individual and said, you need to define yourselves and you need to find meaning in many people that are choosing some part of their life to invest with meaning. And I think that's a very postmodern problem. This is amplified by things like social media, which encourage us to see ourselves sort of as curating a brand right, of who I am. And again, it focuses on the identity. What's meant to connect us is really scattering us into a bunch of individual pieces. And so universities are not immune to this, right? We could probably think of all sorts of ways in which social media is affecting universities. But in general, what it also means is that universities are not coherent places necessarily anymore. What you find are competing interests inside of universities, which maybe has always been true to some degree, but you see a fragmentation of the different disciplines, right? An inability to come up with a core curriculum or a core understanding of things in many universities, or even for a purpose for the university outside economic purposes. That will end us for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the sort of introduction to both modernism and postmodernism and started to see some of those connections between philosophy, religion, and higher education. Um, I encourage you, um, I included some references here in this um, slideshow. I encourage you to go take a look at those if you have a chance. I think you'll get a lot out of it.